Hello and welcome to tonight's edition of the Evening Review. My name is Toivan Jabala, your host. Let's quickly look at the front page of today's Namibian Sun. In tonight's segment uh, of interviews, I'm joined by a very special, f uh, special friend, uh, uh, John Matsi. Uh, he's uh, special in the sense that uh, he has achieved so much, uh, with, uh, despite what many would think uh, limitations. Uh, welcome to the, sh to the show, John. Thank you, Tevo. Yeah. L l let's talk quickly about your origins. Where did you come from, originally? <coughs> I... I was born in a small village called Wantananga in Oshikoto region. Yeah. In the Olukonda constituency. In Olukonda That's constituency. That's where I hail from. Definitely. Mm. So John, you are you are visually impaired and you have defied all odds. But we'll come to the to that later. Uh, when did you lose when were you born visually impaired or did you lose your vision somewhere along the way? I was born just a a normal child with the sight yeah but um, i later lost uh, my vision when at the very tender age around about four five to six years somewhere there uh -huh. yeah um although it's not really clear but uh, narration say it was missiles yeah and you know it was late somewhere in the 80s yes. where healthcare was somewhat um below standard so yes. that was the cause i see mm. very sad indeed oh, <clears throat> but of course now you you have too young you were four or five too young to recollect everything mm. but uh, i'm sure you still you'd still have um uh, 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 glimpses of uh, how things were at the time so how how did you feel at the time of course as a child uh, i'm again i'm asking with uh, all sensitivity here considering that you were just a child mm -hmm. <coughs> but knowing at that age that you'll never be able to see in the true sense of in the true sense of the word seeing um, y your friends and family again how, how did you feel at the time i actually as, as it happened when i was quite young i didn't re really um uh um feel hard done by that because mm -hmm. Most of my memories uh, started when I was already visually impaired. Mm. I grew up with little vision, uh, uh, which I have until now. Mm. So to me, it was normal life. And I thought that's how I was born even. Mm. Although I have very, very limited uh, recollections of normal vision. But I didn't really uh, miss that normal vision. Indeed. Yeah. But as, as time went by, as you now grew into accepting uh, your, your new realities, mm -hmm. uh, you must have had dreams um, growing up as a child uh, to say, when I grow up, I want to be like this or, or like that. And at the time, I'm sure <clears throat> there were no many inspirations around you to say uh, a person in a similar situation has gone on to achieve this or that. Um, how did you uh, f how did you feel at the time as far as uh, pursuing your dreams was concerned? My dreams have been there since my young youngest age, and um, in fact, they were detached from my visual impairment. Yeah. Um, perhaps to the fact that I grew up as a normal child. Um, looking after Keta alongside my siblings mm. and cousins as we grew up in an extended family, yeah. um, cultivating the soil with anyone else. And when the, 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 the Keta uh, got into someone's field, 
I was also not spared the flog like just like anyone else. Mm -hmm. So to that uh, extent, I didn't really treat myself special, and I had a dream just like anyone else mm -hmm. around me. Indeed. Yeah. Uh, tell me, John, just for for context, mm -hmm. in what kind of family did you grow up? Uh, um, I'm, I'm thinking of what you went on to achieve. Of course, like I said, we'll talk about that later. But did you grow up in a family that understood uh, that um, that actually sort of is it is, is it a normal traditional family or is it a family that also had a blend of understanding that they needed to take care of the future of their child? Um, actually, I was I was raised up by my grandmother, by my that's my mother's mother. Mm. That's why I grew up with my fellow cousins, aunts, uncles, and just like a normal extended family household mm. in northern Namibia. So, um, as I said, I started school quite a bit late, mm. um, considering the, the school going age, perhaps because they, have, uh, they didn't have knowledge about uh, schools for for children with disabilities mm. so that that was the setup i grew up in that was the setup I, yes the <clears throat> and and just um the kind of school um I, I i suppose you must have started school in your village also did the school have the, the amenities necessary for a person with your with your condition so actually now uh when i was growing up now I started getting concerned that even my cousins that are much younger than I were going to school and I stay behind. Mm. So I didn't know it was down to my vision, which is, is not uh, able to, to allow me to go to a normal school in mm. my village. So mm. um, therefore later on when I was, I was even around nine years, that's when I was enrolled at the Lua Special School in Ongodiva. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Indeed. Um, so the, then, then you, you, of course, I, I, I met you in, in high school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you were my junior mm -hmm. by a year. Um, we met in Gabriel Tapopi. Indeed. And uh, you were, uh, Gabriel Tapopi is not a special school. Yes, it's not. But uh, just the same as university you, uh, where you went eventually. But but how was it working in a or actually being in a school that doesn't that is not a special school, but perhaps that only had special provisions for you? Um, maybe compared to Elua, how, how, how would you say uh, the situation was at, at Gabriel Tapopi? Yeah, starting with Elua, Elua is a special school, yes. just as its name. Uh, states. Yes. The in Elua, everyone around you is visually impaired, just like yourself. Yes. Uh, if not visually impaired, it's uh, having hearing impaired, mm. impairment. Mm. Uh, um, so there we are taught, just like any other children are taught. But the difference was that we are using braille. Mm. You know, braille that we read with our fingers. Yes. So there, that's why I scored until grade ten. From grade ten. I have to to proceed to grade 11 and 12. That's now how I came to Gabriel Tabovi, where which is an inclusive school. Yeah. So Gabriel Tabovi, we are taught with anyone else in the same classroom, given the same tests, given the same lessons. However, we were still using our braille, and then um, we type with our braille machines. That was the only difference. Mm -hmm. So the difference that Gabriel Tawopi was now different that now not everyone else around me was visually impaired, mm -hmm. but uh, now we are mixed. Uh, uh, it's an inclusive school. It was quite a, 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 a change of, of, of setup mm -hmm. because now mm -hmm. we are now coming into real contact with the real world other than being just isolated. Um, in a certain community of children with visual impairment, mm. which is a good thing, actually, mm. because mm. we are from society and we should remain in the society. Indeed. Mm. I proceeded to university ahead of you, and then mm. a year later, there you were again also yeah. at university, <laughs> and I was wondering, how did Matsi made it? Yeah, make it. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, how, how, what, what, what's your experience at university? It's a broader world now um, with little supervision, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. uh, unlike in, in high school where your superintendents will be chasing you from, <laughs> mm -hmm. from being seated, uh, wandering outside the blocks and whatnot. You went to university where it was really self-supervision. Mm -hmm. um, how would you describe your experience at the university at the time? Actually, um, proceeding to a university now, um, it was also another drastic change mm. compared to the previous one of uh, a high school. Because there it was now again being thrown into a deep end and not being able to swim. Because yes. um, uh, much uh, given that the university was just started um, with admitting uh, students with visual impairment like a previous year. I was just a second student mm -hmm. with visual impairment. So equipments were just not there and it was really a challenge, but if you persevere and the will is there to, 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 to prosper, mm. you, the mind, it was down up to the mind to, to make me through. Just for the sake of our viewers, uh, uh, John, what did you study at UNAM for your first degree? I enrolled for the Bachelor of Art in Psychology, whereby I, ma I majored in Industrial Psychology and Sociology. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you went on to actually do your, your Master's at mm. uh, UNAM also. Mm. Uh, that was in, uh, in Gender and Development Studies? Yes, indeed. Okay, that, that's, that's exactly one of the inspirations that I think uh, a lot of us must step from. Um, <coughs> from university, what did you do? So, I completed the degree in 2008, and then now comes now the reality now that everyone has to face after university, which is looking for a job. Mm. So, it was not an easy thing. It much especially if you have a disability. So in 2000, the whole of 2008, I didn't have a job. Then 2009, I got a job at the Ministry of Labor, mm -hmm. where I'm currently is. And so a few years later now, uh, 2016, I, I decided this is not what I, I, I all aim up to, mm -hmm. so I should aim high. And I then decided to enroll for the Master of Gender in, in Development Studies, which mm -hmm. I graduated now last year. I see. <coughs> well, why, why that field specifically? Uh, was there special motivation or you just uh, went for it? Yeah, I, because um, my first degree is in Social Science, yeah. which is Psychology and Sociology. However, I felt um, in love with Sociology uh, you know, we are from society and sociology, it's more of a study to understand society mm -hmm. in, a, in, an, in depth. So I, I, I decided that gender and, and disability, they are both fields of minority and they are, all, they are both in one way or another marginalized. Mm -hmm. a study of marginalization so i decided let me go for gender and then i have to specialize in women with disabilities mm -hmm. that are suffering from double discrimination in the first place as women and then secondary as persons with disabilities indeed so that was my thesis profound profound mm -hmm. uh, john your <coughs> your current job again on the show you are you are speaking in your private capacity mm -hmm. But you are, your title is now a, la a Chief Labor Relations Officer? Right. Yeah. Uh, well, what does your job entail? So, um, my job entails to provide um, administration or secretarial functions to the Labor Advisory Council. Mm -hmm. the, the council is a tripartite body made up of um, employers, representatives, workers' representatives, and then state representatives. Mm. So we, I now form part of the secretariat that um, do all their sort of researches and all sorts of administrative functions. Mm -hmm. But does the environment provide for, for ease of work? Uh, to say, 
I mean, the research, for example, uh, requires, I suppose, that there should be some special uh, measures in place for you to, to do that. If you are going to Google, maybe to look up some articles in law, mm -hmm. labor law, whatever, uh, how, how, how conducive is your environment? Yeah, um, unlike what many people think, people, uh, employing a person with disability isn't that much a burden yes. to an employer. So all I needed was just a computer installed with a screen reader yes. that enables me to read through documents, read through uh, websites. So and then that on that on its own, I'm able to to Google, search through um, Google search, and read anything in the soft copy mm. format. Although the challenge only comes up in, especially in hard copies, mm. whereby, of course, I'm not able to read on the paper, black and white. But with uh, assistive devices, I'm able to, different assistive devices, I'm quite able to function independently, just like anyone else. Indeed. Yeah. Now, we've been chatting the whole day today on the, on the phones, uh, mm -hmm. sending each other text messages, mm -hmm. uh, which... Uh, gives me the impression that uh, somehow you can do exactly what I can do, mm. uh, so which, which is a positive thing. Mm. John, people with disability have always had consent in our country. I mm -hmm. think there's a great deal of work being put into your lives so that uh, your lives are a bit um, conducive, mm -hmm. but we are not quite there yet. Um, Without, speci without referring to anything, sp to any employer spe specifically, how much do you think you command, uh, how much respect do you think you, you command within your work peers, whether it's in the same ministry or just uh, as, as government employees, um, do people accord you the respect that you truly deserve and do they respect your output or do you co encounter situations where people actually question your abilities, just not because of your output but because mm -hmm. Of your, your condition yeah you know um, we are coming from a society that culturally looks down upon persons with disabilities yeah so um, I'm sure you must have heard of stories of um, people hiding persons with disabilities yes. in a faraway hut somewhere at the back of the house mm -hmm. yes you know um, perhaps only taken out when it's a uh, social grant um, paid day yes. and such things. So uh, I, I did, I never, and then now plus now that I studied psych, uh, sociology and so psychology, mm. I, I don't expect everyone to to treat me positively, but I'm very much prepared for any sort of treatment. Mm. So I, I do receive mixed um, perception from people, but uh, that the negative ones only make me stronger and and prove them otherwise. So some people think you are only there for window dressing. Yeah. And although um, some uh, really feel, no, this is quite an uh, inspiration and should be an encouragement to others. Mm -hmm. So it's a mixed, mixed, uh, mi mixed um, uh, thing. Um, but we we soldier on. We soldier on. Yeah. Just uh, the second last question, John, is before I ask you to give us maybe just a message later. Mm. You, last time I checked, you were an ardent football fan. Mm. You, you, you still follow football. True. Yeah, still. <laughs> which, which, which yeah. one is your team? Is it, was it many or what was it? <laughs> In fact, like my now, it's currently a sad time for me because my 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 beloved food, football game is. No, on a break, yes. mostly just like anything. Uh, but I support um, Manchester United of England, and locally I support Tigers. <laughs> yeah, support Tigers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Tell me because I, I find that is that very very uh, exciting in, yeah. in so many ways because um, I, I I remember <coughs> during our university days I would come to your to your room in the hostels. Yeah. 
<coughs> and you'll be listening uh, to radio and following commentary. Yeah. <coughs> um, and, and, and you, you, you possessed this uh, incredible knowledge of the game. <coughs> but what I wonder about is where do you draw your excitement from? Uh, because others have the pleasure of watching bicycle kicks and, mm. and, and players shoving each other's chest after rough tackles and all that. Um, but you enjoy as much uh, the, the game as everybody else. Yeah. You? How, how do you do that? Yeah, you know, um, the commentator is there for a reason. Yeah. But I know most when most people watch soccer, they, they, they ignore the commentator and just focus on the visual part. Mm. That's why I, I, I like following a soccer match in a house in a household environment yes way back and hear the commentator what he's saying so and then on top of that i then follow opinions supporters opinions yeah. which is mostly written on on websites yeah so th by then i would really have a, a full understanding of a player if he's good average or bad mm -hmm. so almost just like anyone else, just like yeah. Anyone else. So yeah, indeed, <laughs> I really have a, a, a full understanding of a sport. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't only follow Manchester, but I follow almost all the top leagues. Mm -hmm, I'm mm -hmm. very much uh, updated with them. Indeed. Yeah. What must happen? Uh, let me just pick your brain on that because mm. we we now have that situation of COVID nineteen. The leagues mm. are off. Mm. Saturdays and Sundays have become very depressing days if you like for those mm. of us who religiously follow football mm. uh, i understand i was reading somewhere today where they said uh, the english premier league they'll they will start training by the 18th, 18th of this month with a few players coming in and you have to manage how they come to training mm. um as, an, as a sports fan what do you think uh, should happen going forward uh, should should liverpool actually be awarded the the league title or or must they <laughs> <laughs> what, must, what, must, what must be the, the conclusion to this season? Yeah, no, uh, I think it's, a, it's good they should try by all means just to conclude the league. Yeah. And then um, give the, 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 the title to, to the deserving Liverpool. Mm -hmm. I mean, a team being six points away from getting the title and then you, you think of scrapping everything away. It will be unfair in all sense. It will be unfair. Yeah, so... Perhaps for that, they should just try by all means and then conclude the league yeah. and then start afresh next season. Indeed. Yeah. Because there are nine matches left. I see in Beige, uh, is it in, in, in Holland, they have uh, declared no winner of the league. There are no relegation, there are no champions. Mm. While in France, uh, FPSG have been awarded the, the league title. Mm. And there's a small team, I think it's called Amiens or something, that is complaining that because they were relegated mm -hmm. while the, the game uh, still had, uh, or the league still had uh, games left to play. Mm -hmm. So we'll see what, what goes on there. But uh, in, uh, in conclusion, John, um, again, a very, very inspirational story mm -hmm. uh, that, you, that you have and that you have uh, shared with our viewers tonight. But mm -hmm. tell us, um, what, is, what, what is your message to people uh, who find themselves with disability in particular and have been written off essentially by those around them. Uh, what kind of message do you have to them, but also to the authorities who have the responsibility to protect these people and ensure that they create an, a, an environment where they will thrive like anyone else? Mm. Okay, no, uh, before I come to the question, um, you know, persons with disabilities in general uh, fall into that category of um, um, minority people mm. or disadvantaged people. Yeah. So it's up to them and every nation to look after these people. Mm. So like much in our case now, in our country's case, mm. we have very good legislations that uh, look after persons with disabilities, mm. although maybe they are not so well implemented sure if you remember um almost at every advert a job advert mm. there's always a, a, a small sentence there down there women 
and persons with disabilities can you conclude it for me uh, we'll get uh, preference i always encourage to apply <laughs> i always encourage yeah. to apply yeah. yes. you know that sentence is always there <laughs> yes but if you look academics you are an academic and the researcher also mm. persons with disabilities form part of a unemployed majority yes. of global uh, population so and the few ones that are employed are still concentrated in two entry and low positions mm. so it's high time now um, writers and researchers start unpacking this sort of uh, prejudices that mm. are uh, um, marginalizing the people mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so every now and then you hear of persons with disabilities who are shown on in different media houses of having acquired qualifications but not being able to get a job mm. so so the reason why i'm saying this is that sometimes you, despite having a qualification there's still some sections that will still question you your ability mm. to perform mm. but uh, that should not discourage us from 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 doing what is right mm -hmm. from building our human capital a, a human a, a great mind supersedes um visual impairment mm -hmm. a great mind supersedes hearing impairment a great mind supersedes um physical impairment mm -hmm. so to encourage to fellow persons with disabilities is that it's up to you to decide if you want to remain a, a, a charity object for the rest of your life mm. or you want to transform yourself and turn yourself into someone independent who is having a, a living mm. on your own and just like anyone else indeed mm. john thank you very much for coming man thank you I really appreciate it. Uh, and I see you are also a married man now. Also, uh, <laughs> pass my kind regards to your family. I will. I Thank will. you very much for inviting me. I appreciate it. Yeah. Fact. All right. There was uh, John uh, Matsi. He is uh, visually impaired, but a very, very courageous man who has defied all odds to be where he is today. I hope uh, you have drawn inspiration from this interview, like I did. Uh, good night. <laughs>